we begin Baruch Hashem a new Mesaches, new tractate, tractate Saito. Not God forbid a new tractate. It's been around for many years. It's new to our shir. So by way of a shtickle introduction, first of all, we're going to learn the relevant verses in the Torah that describe the law of the Saita. Because of course the Gemara is going to get into analyzing each of these lines and each of these words. So we should be familiar with them. And just a general outline of what the mitzvah is, the Saita, before we get into the Gemara. By way of uh, even introduction to that, you know, let's first learn the, learn the Chumash and then we'll do that, uh, that introduction. Okay, so it's Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 5, verse 11, through the end of the chapter. So we're not going to learn the, the uh, Rashi, we're just going to learn the Chumash, the direct Hebrew, and translate it. It's uh, something like 20 verses. Okay, so God speaks to Moshe saying, Mitzvah. Dabel the day, Israel speak to the Jewish people of Amartalema, and you shall say to them, Here's what you shall deliver to the Jewish people. Here's the message. Ish ish, any man, kisishte istoi, when his wife will go astray, umala boy mal, and she behaves, I hear the translator is treacherously with him. Mala means to be like this, to be disrespectful. And in what way is she disrespectful? Uh, and she will lie with another man, an intimate relationship, and she will do so hidden from her husband's eye. Isha, there's a dot on the hay, not meaning a woman, but ish, her, her husband. And she's secluded, the nitma. And she's been indeed been defiled. She engaged intimately with this man. The aid ain't ba. And there's no witness to say what happened behind those closed doors. The he learned and she was not caught. Here the translator has seized. She was not seized. I'm looking at the Chabad Rob translation. Sorry? Yeah, it was done willingly. She was, yeah, that's right. She wasn't, she wasn't the. Uh, wasn't caught, meaning by the person, not caught as in no one saw her. She wasn't caught by the person who take her. In other words, she went in willingly. Okay. So the woman is leaving her husband and engaging with another man intimately. Nobody sees what happened, but she willingly engaged in a private room with this person. Now, the overall love of Ruach Kina. Now he, the husband, is jealous. The Kine is Tishai, and he warns her. So here's an important detail to the law. Um, okay, here's interesting how they translate it. But in the spirit of jealousy, he came, up, he came upon him, he became jealous of his wife, and she was defiled. And his, his spirit or spirit of jealousy has come upon him, and he was jealous of his wife, and she was not defiled. Okay. The kinis ishta literally means he's jealous of his wife, but as we're going to learn, the kinis ishta means he warns her. There's an important detail on the law. He warns her against being with this man. And then she indeed did go with this man and became impure, right? She willingly engaged in an intimate relation with this man. Or he was jealous of her. He's jealous for her. And he warns her. And she wasn't. She didn't become impure. So the law that we're about to describe is both, right? So before we just said that we're talking about a woman who's misbehaving and she's doing so willingly. That's essentially what we said till now. And, and there are no witnesses to what happened behind closed doors. Now the Torah is telling us that this engagement that she did with this man behind closed doors, for which there's no witnesses, was precipitated by the husband being jealous of her and warning her. And the law that's about to follow is both in scenario where she did engage with this man or she didn't engage with this man. And in both these cases, we don't know what happened because there's no witness. But we do know that he warned her before. But the Torah isn't really speaking chronologically. It lays out first the end game and then goes back to what happened at the beginning. Right? And all these are going to be analyzed. But are we following? Yes. We're going to see how and why we know that. The Gemara is going to get to that. Right? Uh, there's one witness, or he saw her, he saw them going behind closed doors. Right? So 
They went behind closed doors. We don't know what happened behind those closed doors. It doesn't matter what happened behind closed doors because the law that's going to follow is going to be both for whether she did engage or she didn't engage with this man. But it was pre precipitated by his jealousy and his warning. That's what we know so far. Now verse 15, chapter 5 by Midbar. So now the man wants to know what happened behind these closed doors because he was he, he was war, he warned her, he's jealous. He sees she's become familiar with this fellow. And she warns him, do not go, do not be, don't spend private time with this guy. Don't even talk to him is what she, he says, actually, we'll, as we'll learn in the Gemara and the Mishnah. But, and now they've been in behind closed doors and he doesn't know what happened. But he wants to know what happened. Right, he wants to know, did she, was she, was she faithful? Was she not faithful? So the Havi is Ishtayel Kayan. She'll bring his wife, he will bring his wife to the Kayan. The Havi is Karbana. She'll bring her, her offering, which is made up of uh, Allah on this whole matter. Uh, which is made up of a siris a a tenth of an eifa of kemach sa'irim, of, of uh, barley flour, which is unusual, carbon, and we'll talk about that. La yitzik ala shemon, there shouldn't be any oil in it, which is also unusual. Usually there is oil mixed with the with the flour. And they shouldn't put this special frankincense, which is ordinarily brought with, in other words, every single carbon is accompanied by a mincha, a uh, a uh, grain-based offering. And the grain-based offering is usually flour, uh, flour made of wheat mixed with oil and uh, some of lavoina of this frankincense of some sort, some sort of um, spice. Um, that's ordinarily what happens every single carbon. This one, for most carbonas, but it, the oil do you have actually, which is not the, not the lavoina. Right, Pesach is also unusual. The Pesach, these are all exceptions to the rule. Those are all exceptions to the rule. So, but the, the, the big exception here is there is another carbon which also has salidim. The most, the big exception here is that A, that first of all, that it's in that category of carbon that don't get oil and don't get lavoina, don't get these frankincense. And uh, the biggest uh, exception here is that it's actually made of barley, which is, there's another carbon which is also barley, but most are made of flour. Correct. Because she behaved, because the whole thing is an animalistic uh, mistake, which is why she brings animal fodder. Correct, it's Bahamas, as we're going to learn. Okay, then Kiminchas uh, Kanois, who, because this is a offering of jealousy, meaning some offering of goodness, it's an offering of mistake. Minchas Zikari Maskeras Ovain, it's a meal offering, meaning it's a grain based offering to remember something terrible, something of iniquity, a, a, an oven, a sin. Okay, now, the Kayan will offer it, the middle of Nehashem. And she shall be presented before Hashem in the basement. Now she's there. The carbon has been brought and she's there. So what is what happens now? How do we determine what happened behind those closed doors? So says the Torah. The Mayim Kedoshim, the Kli Cheresh, the Kayan takes holy waters and puts it into a earthenware vessel. Cheres. Umina Afar Ashayyib Bakaka Mishkan. He's got to take earth that's from the actual floor of the sanctuary or later on in the temple in Jerusalem. Yikach al-Kayin, the Kayin shall take, the Nasan al and he shall put this earth into the water. Every single detail is going to be analyzed. It's got to be actually holy water, whatever that means. It's got to be from the actual ground of the, of the Mishkan. They have to dig into the actual ground. They can't come from outside. There's going to be a lot of details of that too. Then, the of the Kayin is the Hashem. Now the Kayin shall position the woman in front of Hashem, upara Raisha, and expose her hair, her head, right? She, people should see, you know, uncover her head. The Nosan al Kapa. And she will put into her hand, S Minchas as a card in this meal offering that we just offered before. Minchas Kanois, which is this jealousy offering. Uviada Kayin, and in the hands of the Kayin, and the two of them together are holding it. Which one? Upara Esraisha, Esraisha Aisha. A chapter in verse 18. Esra Isha Isha. Yeah, the, 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 the sorry, yeah, not Raisha. Raisha Isha, the high level. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, so he, he puts the offering in her hand and he's holding it too, the Kayan and her holding it together. Who made him a um, Uyada Kayan. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She's holding the mill offering. And the Kayan's hand, he's holding the water, the cursed water, the water mixed with the earth. 
Now, while she's holding this, while she's holding the uh, offering, the Kayan makes her take an oath. And he tells the woman, if you did not engage with that man behind those closed doors, then and you did not astray to be, allow yourself to be defiled. Instead of your husband, whom you're supposed to be with, intimate with, if you didn't go with this guy, you will be cleansed of these bitter, cursed waters. Because you didn't do anything. You're in closed doors, but you didn't engage with him. And therefore, but you, if you did stray away from your husband, and you did defile yourself with this man, and you've taken a man into you, as Sheikh Vasoy, his laying with you, someone who is not your husband, then, if that's the case, he will, he, the woman, the Kayim will make the woman swear, in this swearing of a curse. And the Kayim tells the woman, Quote, this is what the Quran says. God shall place you into a curse and an oath amongst your people or a cursed oath amongst your people. The taste Hashem is Yechech when you, <clears throat> when Hashem will cause that your, uh, your your thighs will fall over or, or rupture as they translated here. And your belly will swell. And this will be because because these cursed waters will go into you, into your stomach, lit boys betten, causing your uh, stomach to swell, the limp and causing your thigh to fall. The Amra Isha Amen Amen. And the woman says Amen Amen to both the curse and the blessing. Right? So we don't know what happened behind closed doors. Now we have the test. The test is while she's holding this minchas kanais, this this meal offering, the coin's holding the water mixed with the earth. And he makes you swear, you're about to drink this water. And when you do, either you will have been proved innocent because you didn't do anything, or you will have been proven guilty and God will punish you as, accordingly. And then she responds, Amen, to this vow. Now, what does the Kayan do? Now she has to drink it. But before she drinks it, before she drinks the water, is one more part of the procedure. The cost of Allah Sa'ila, and the Kayan shall write down these curses onto a scroll, the sefer on, on a scroll, umacha el hamarim, and he will erase it in these in these uh, bitter waters. So, yes, so he takes the scroll, puts it into the water, mixes it until all the ink comes off. Now the hishka is saying, now the, the, the process can, the Gemara is going to discuss exactly what he writes. Every single detail is going to be analyzed. We're just getting the overview of the overarching story so we know what we're getting, what we're talking about when we get into it. The hishka is saying, isha hamarim, Hamarim, and the woman shall drink these bitter, cursed waters. And these bitter and these cursed waters will come enter her and become bitter within her. And now but she's been holding this meal off the entire time. So now the Kayan takes it from her. And he waves the meal offering in the presence of Hashem. This is a not uncommon procedure with uh, offerings with the Kayan or sometimes the owner of the, of the offering, sometimes both together, will, ra- will hold the offering and wave it in all directions in the present, uh, facing the uh, Holy of Holies. He can raise the of Beach, and then he offers the meal offering on the altar. Then, the comments are coming in Mincha after it's, after it's offered. The comments are coming in Mincha, ask Askarasa, he shall, uh, he shall take a comment, is another um, process that's very common in offerings. In fact, all Minchas have, have this, where comments means uh, the meal offering is quite large. And what the Kayan does is he takes a uh, fistful of the of the uh, offering, and then he op- uh, 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 al and then he he actually offers that on the mezbech. He pours it onto the uh, altar, onto the fire. So, and the whole time, right? They um, they switched. He was holding. She was holding the meal offering. He said the curses while she was while he was holding the water. She says amen. Then they switch. And then they, they write. Then they write down the uh, the curse. They mix it into the water and they switch. He takes the offering, brings it to Ms. Beth as the offering, and now she has the water. And then, and then he shall give the woman to drink of the water. Oh, I'm not sure if she holds it the whole time. Maybe somebody else holds it. But then at that point, she's given to drink after he's made the offering. Yes, after, he's, after he does kmitza, after he sprinkles the uh, fistful. The fistful is also very detailed. He, he, it's not a big fist, it's a half a fist. It's like a. No, no, yes, but he. But he 
his hand is closed before he goes in. He doesn't go like that and grab the whole thing. Yeah, but his hands are actually closed already. Then he picks up whatever is, comes in. Kind of, it, it's, a, it's a detailed specific process. And it has to bring a certain amount. It's actually one of the comp more complicated parts of the uh, offering. Okay, so now, he shall make her drink the water. And then the results will be if she did defile herself willingly, and he behaved unfaithfully with her husband. Isha again, the dot in the middle of the hay, telling Isha, her husband. And then those waters will come in, those cursed waters will come into her and become bitter. And her 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 belly shall indeed swell. The nafa yerecha and her thigh will indeed fall. And she will become a cursed woman amongst her people. That's if she did defile. But if she does not defile herself, the woman did not uh, defile herself. She didn't engage with this husband, with this, woman, with this other man, with this stray man. And she's indeed clean. The nixa, then the water shall cleanse her. zara, and she will bear. She'll have children if she had a problem beforehand. As we're going to learn the Gemara. If she had a hard time giving birth, she'll have an easy time giving birth. If she didn't have children, she'll have children and so on. Okay, so this is now the end of the story, really. But then the Torah adds another line. And this other line is going to add more details to the, to the halacha as we're going to learn. And this is like this. O yish, but, or if a man... Which a spirit of jealousy came upon him. The kinnis ishta and he warned his and he warned his wife. The hem of this ishlef neashem, and he put his her husband. He he positioned his wife in the presence of the before God. But also lock as a koyin as kolteris hazois hazois, and the koyin um will do all the procedures described above. Described above the nika ishma avayin, then. The man will be free of anything, meaning he did nothing wrong by the fact that he brought her there and caused this curse to come upon her. And the woman will carry the bear the burden of the guilt because it was her problem for having been misfaithful. Okay, so that's the overarching story, and all of these lines are going to be analyzed uh, throughout the Gemara. So that was the first introduction, as it were, from the, to the Gemara that I want to look at uh, before we got to the actual text. Another introduction I want to do is, and this is on the spiritual side. So because we're going to, uh, the Gemara is actually going to have quite a bit of spiritual messages related to the Saita, and it's important that we have an overarching theme as to what the spiritual message and significance here is. We know from Shira Shidim, the Song of Songs, and this is quoted in the Medrash a number of times, even in the Gemara and Tainus, the Gemara famous is in Tainus, that the, describing the Matan Torah as a chasana, as a, the, describing the giving of the Torah as a wedding between husband and wife, between God and the Jewish people. So God is the husband, and uh, we are the, the wife. And a spirit of kisista, right? We, we, we are led astray. It's the word sister. It's the word the Gemari Tari uses, kisista. This word sister, led astray, is also related, as we're going to learn, to the word shaita, foolishness. The spirit of foolishness within us, otherwise known as our animal soul, or otherwise known as our evil inclination. The foolishness within us leads us astray and tells us to be intimate with other gods. Other gods don't necessarily mean idols that they used to worship in ancient Greece or in ancient Mesopotamia. Idols could also mean worshiping, as my father refers to it, the almighty the almighty dollar. <laughs> you know, you know, you know the uh, the famous story of the previous Rebbe when he was arrested. One of the times that he was taken inter interrogated by the um, by the communists for his revolutionary activities in keeping Yiddishkeit alive in communist Russia. The famous story is that he wasn't really cooperating very well and uh, he wasn't answering the questions as they wanted him to. So one of the uh, guards takes out a gun, puts it onto the table and says, calls him by his first name or his last name and says, this little toy made many people talk, referring to the gun. And the previous server responded very calmly said that toy makes people talk if they have multiple gods and one world. But if you have two worlds and one God, the gun doesn't really matter much. Okay, so the two worlds and one God, we understand. 
you have one God. That's who, that's who you have faith in. You believe that he controls the world. And if you're not in this world, you're in another world. What's the difference? Wherever Hashem wants you to be, that's where you are. The gun's not going to make a difference. Of course, this is a level, very high level to be at, but at least we can appreciate it. But what did, he, what did he mean when he said that you have multiple gods in one world? The communists were atheists. What kind of multiple gods is he referring to? So it might be understood quite simply. They have a lot of gods. The Rolex is one god. Their other god is their car. The other god, god is social status. The other god is their BA or their MA, whatever they have. And the other god is their house. The other god is doing every other desire that comes to them, right? So uh, straying from another God, another husband, doesn't mean uh, bowing down, God forbid, to Zeus. I don't think anybody's struggling with that nowadays. But other gods, we definitely have other gods that we tend to worship almost every day, unfortunately. And that's the story of the Saita. Uh, Hashem, is, uh, Hashem is, as a word, jealous. Hashem wants a, an intimate, exclusive relationship with us. And here we are following foolish foreign gods, engaging in other relationships. And therefore, the choice is, the choice is ours, right? In, in our minds, we are nistra, we're concealed. There's two ways you can think of concealed. Either it's the mistaken view that we're alone and God's not watching, or a person feels like God's hidden from me. I don't see him here with me. So I'm just going to engage with whatever is available. And there too, says Hashem, I'm there. And there too, I want to know how you're doing. And there too, I'm hoping to be one with you. And I, don't, I, I can't stand seeing you giving away your soul to foreign gods that are not exclusively Hashem himself. So that's the spiritual uh, description of the Saita. And that's the halachic description overarching theme of the Saita. And as we go through the Gemara, we're going to see many more details in both regards, both in regard to the literal halachic details of the Saita, as well as uh, the spiritual details of the Saita. Okay, I think we're going to stop over here. It's kind of overview introduction. You kind of know what we're doing. And uh, Mr. Shem, we're going to enjoy and grow in our learning here. Have a wonderful day, everybody.